Our scripture this morning is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and it's uh, verses 11 through 22, and it's about how the Gentiles and the Jews all became one in Christ. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Now, last week I didn't get a chance to really set up um, our sermon series for the next few weeks. So in the next few weeks, we're going to be studying from the book of Ephesians. Uh, and so in this week in our series, we find Paul writing to the Gentiles. Now, this in of itself is not a surprising thing. Remember, Paul was called to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people of the world. And Paul starts by reminding them how far away they were from God, how they were living their lives without the covenant that God had made with his people. And he tells them because of this, they were living lives without hope. Paul then reminds them, the Gentiles, how they have become one with the body of believers through their shared belief in Jesus as the Messiah. And he reminds them, in this case, that the believers that were Jewish, that they have all now entered into a new covenant with God through the mighty acts of Jesus Christ on the cross and through his resurrection. Paul tells them that as such, they have now entered into that covenant with God and they have the greatest hope that the world has ever known. He goes on to tell them they all have access in one spirit to the Father and they are no longer strangers, but they are now fellow citizens in the household of God. And in this portion of the letter, he also talks about how Jesus preached a gospel of peace and how that gospel of peace abolished the laws and ordinances that they had been living under to that point. So today I wanted to focus on two things. One, how we are no longer strangers to one another and how the idea of peace was radical then and it is radical now. Now, when I was a very small child, perhaps around the age of three or four, I had a VHS tape because that is how my age uh, kind of works out. So I had a VHS tape. You young kids that don't know, that's what there were before Blu-ray or streaming and but even before DVDs. Um, so we had a VHS tape and this tape uh, was on the idea of what we called stranger danger. And you see at the time there seemed to have been a switch in mentality in the country. We are moving away from this idea of knowing our neighbors and knowing our communities and into a state of fear and fearing those that we did not know. 
And then this video, we talk, it talked about how we should react if someone we didn't know was trying to talk to us or lure us away from our home or family. It told us that we were supposed to yell, stranger danger! And then run away to someone that we knew or someone that was in a, a figure of authority like a police officer. Now, I know that that might seem like a silly thing to some people, um, but the fact of the matter is the whole thing is quite sad. <laughs> You see, this movement came about because there had been so many abductions. And obviously, this had a major impact on me because 35 years later, I can still remember that video and what I was supposed to do. But I can also remember thinking, can I not trust anyone who isn't of my own family? Should I never talk to anyone else? Well, the answer to that question is an ambiguous yes and no. You see, I truly do believe that the majority of people are good or at least have good intentions, but we know that we must still be on guard against those who would wish to do us harm or our family harm. Now, in recent times, it feels as if we've moved further into our own little silos, away from the outside world and indeed even away from one another. I know so many of us are still dealing with with the effects of isolation during the height of the pandemic. And we will continue to see the ramifications of that in the future. But we have also found ourselves at a point in this world where we appear to be divided along many other things, one of which is along political lines. And we will see that in the upcoming split that is coming to the United Methodist Church, we again will find ourselves divided over the idea of where the church should go. You see, all of these things have made it feel as if people that we once knew have become strangers to us. And our natural defense for many of us, as I said before, a stranger means danger. Well, brothers and sisters, Paul reminds us today that we that have accepted Jesus as our Savior are no longer strangers to one another. We are part of the same body. We are brought together for the purpose of being in covenant with God and to help spread that gospel to others in this world so they might not be strangers any longer. Will we always agree on everything? Show me a family that does. If you think your family always agrees on everything, I simply want you to ask this question in a family setting, and it is this. Where should we go for dinner tonight? Chances are you have just started a heated discussion. So know that we, that though we will have our differences, we are no longer strangers to one another. And we can claim this because of our second topic, and that is the gospel of Jesus being about peace. Peace with one another. Peace with strangers. And peace in spite of what the world is calling for. This idea of peace as the foundation of what Jesus was teaching to us in modern day, it sounds like a normal thing, right? Especially those of us that grew up in the church. We know that Jesus preached peace. We uh, that have heard the gospel understand that Jesus was a man of peace. We've been told all the stories of how he refused to fight back during his lifetime, especially during his arrest and during his uh, torture and then crucifixion. We heard how he told others when asked, what do you do when you are struck, Jesus? You turn the other cheek and offer it to them. See, these are stories we have heard since we were small. Even people outside of the church know these stories. And they're ones that we teach to our children as well. But at the time when Jesus was preaching these ideas, the things that he was saying, they were truly radical now, I do not mean the word radical like, again, showing my age, you would hear on Ninja Turtles, like, that's radical, dude. No, I mean an idea that is so different from what, that it, what is established as the norm that it seems crazy. See, the established norm of the time for Jesus was the idea that might makes right. The most powerful armies, the best equipped, the strongest fighters, those were the ones that you were to follow. Those were the people that were to make the rules where you lived. 
And this was especially true, again, at the time when Paul was writing his letter to the Ephesians. You see, in the world of Asia Minor, where Ephesus was located, the people were under control of the Romans. And the Romans were the most powerful army and the greatest conquerors that the world had seen to that point. And they did not gain their power through peace. It came through military might. So when Paul says in our chapter today that the peace and the peace that Jesus preaches is above all ordinances, what he is saying to those people is the idea that peace is above the ideas of the Roman state. And that was a subversive, radical idea. Indeed, it is something that leads to Paul's death at the hands of the Romans. So how do we live out this peace in our lives in the world today? Is it something that we still believe in? Have the ideas of violence and might making right and the strength, uh, have those gone away over the last 2,000 years from when Jesus was preaching peace? Well, the answer to that question is a resounding no. The world is every bit as violent as it was during that time. The world is dominated, or at least it is attempted to be dominated by those who are who considered to be stronger or more well-equipped or more well-armed than their counterparts. And we need look no further than the situation in the Ukraine right now to see that, where one country, especially the leadership of that country, decided that they were stronger and they wanted the Ukrainian land. We need look no further than right there to see the idea of violence and taking by force is still very much alive in this world today. But we as Christians are still called to peace. We are still called to a gospel and to a Messiah who preached the idea of peace. Now, as I was growing up, I have to tell you that I had a bit of an affinity at one point in my life for the hippie movement of the 1960s and 70s. And I think you hear the word peace and a lot of us, you know, that's what we think of, right? Peace. Um, and what I admired about them was the spirit in which they tried to achieve their goals through nonviolence, through the idea of peaceful protest. But as I grew older, my admiration for them, um, and I realized that I am speaking to some people of that generation, by the way, uh, my admiration that I had went away. And it's not because I'm older and more cynical, not because I began to believe that peace was not the way that we should be living. It was because I had felt that they had given up on what they were trying to achieve. See, they were working towards world peace, but something happened and something lured them away from that message and those goals. And I was angry that they had given up. I thought this because what if they had continued pursuing peace? Perhaps my generation and the ones after us would be experiencing world peace by now. Now I realize that is an unfair statement. Many people that were part of that era and movement still are working towards peace in the world. And as I've reevaluated my thoughts on why so many gave up supporting and working for peace, I've come to the conclusion that they were missing a large part in their message. You see, they were working for peace, but their message was a peace in a secular world, in a secular peace. They were missing in their message the peace that was in Jesus Christ. They were missing the key component, the gospel of Jesus as peace. See, there were times and there are times of peace in the world, and there will be people that are peaceful and carry the peace that Jesus Christ talks about. And that is a peace that never ends. It is one that has become so deeply ingrained in us that we are able to look at it in all things and pursue it there. Now I know that it is a tall order to ask. I know that it is difficult to try and achieve that level to put peace above all other things. Brothers and sisters, I can stand before you and honestly say, there are times in my life when I had a chance to pursue peace or a chance to pursue violence, and I chose violence. I am not blameless in this as well. 
But does that mean, since it is a hard thing to achieve, or because I have failed before, does it mean that I can simply not try to follow that path of peace? Does it mean that I can simply, or that we can simply look at it and say, I shouldn't even bother because I can't achieve it? No, we must continue on those lines of working towards peace. We that are Methodists, we would call that sanctifying grace, right? Working towards growing in the Spirit. See, we are called to be those people of peace. And if we are those people of peace, if we are following the examples of the gospel of Christ, then we will find ways to overlook what makes others strangers. The things that divide us in this life and all the differences that we have. When we are following what Christ calls us to do, living our lives according to that gospel of peace, we will find that others are no longer strangers. Because we will all simply become one in the body of Christ. And that is what Paul was talking about in his part of this letter to us today. So my encouragement for you this week and my challenge for you this week is to think about the things that may be dividing you from others. Consider, are they so important that you would continue to pursue them, the things that are dividing you, instead of pursuing the gospel of peace that Jesus Christ has called you to? And if we can do that, we can bring in strangers into the family of God so that we can be a community that is worthy of his gospel. Amen.